I mean, what stands out for me is the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and losing our Secretary General. Not losing him in terms of losing him from his job, but uh, he was not in the office the next day and we were thinking, well, where's he gone? And uh, as a German Secretary General, Manfred Werner, he, he was so delirious that the Berlin Wall had come down that he just jumped in his car and went straight to Berlin during the night to be part of the party with the wall uh, collapsing and we discovered him at a church service in Berlin the next day. So that was a very happy moment. We found our Secretary General, he's still there, but it was part of this euphoria about the fall of the, uh, of, of the Berlin Wall. Although afterwards my wife said to me, Jamie, does that not mean you're out of a job now? Because we won't need NATO any longer and you better start you know, uh, looking through the situations vacant columns of the newspapers and filling in a few job uh, a a applications. So, so that was a, a, a good moment. As globalization gathered pace in the 1990s, new actors and new security challenges began to emerge that forced NATO to rethink its purpose. You know, once my grocer in Brussels said, oh, you work at NATO, what's your job? And I said, I wait to be attacked. That's my job, uh, because uh, deterrence meant nothing changing. And uh, uh, it was really only after the Berlin Wall came down and NATO went from being a, a, an organisation waiting to be attacked to a much more proactive organisation actively trying to shape the future of politics in Central and Eastern Europe and in Yugoslavia. Chapter 3. Post-Cold War. As the threat of all-out war between the two superpowers was fading, old tensions and smaller ethnic and regional conflicts resurfaced in the Balkans and in the Caucasus. With the Soviet Union's grip having collapsed, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe finally got the chance to determine their own destinies. I've been so lucky to have um, benefited from the ability to speak freely, to travel freely, to vote how I want. I wanted to ensure that other people were aware of, of how this has come about and the part that NATO has played in, in that uh, journey. One of the best moments was um, the day that uh, Vaclav Havel came to NATO for the first time. And it was um, very unusual um, and it happens very rarely in NATO's history. But we all went, uh, as many as we possibly could, to gather in the foyer of NATO to welcome him. It was a very moving moment. And that really brought home to me the success of uh, what we'd achieved. Not everyone was happy with NATO's expansion, though. Recently released files revealed that as early as 1995, British ministers considered offering Russia associate membership of NATO so as to tackle concerns across Russia's political system about NATO enlargement. The idea was that associate membership of NATO would allow enlargement to go ahead without rancor and retaliation. The status of associate member would also provide the basis of a credible strategy for NATO's relations with certain other new independent East European states, in particular Ukraine. Countries such as Ukraine, the Baltic states, Belarus and Moldova need their international status strengthened if they are not to be reabsorbed into Moscow's embrace. The proposal did not attract support and was dropped, although it did lead to the creation of the NATO-Russia Council in 2002. Probably the high point of, of cooperation um, was in relation to Bosnia, where the Russians were in many ways quite sympathetic to the Serbs for quite a long time, but gradually came, at least at official level, came to see that uh, what Serbia was doing in Bosnia was really unacceptable, that terrible atrocities were being committed with the support of uh, Slobodan Milosevic, um, and that they also had an interest in stability and peace in that region. And so you got the Dayton peace process, which was actually quite, you know, in many respects, quite a cooperative process. And then the Russians subsequently took part in the peacekeeping operations. Um, and that was, you know, that was a good moment. There was quite close consultation between 
leading Western countries and the, and the Russians, and a real sense that while we might have some different perspectives on details, we were working towards a common objective. With Russia struggling to transition from its socialist past to the globalized liberalism of the 1990s, NATO took an increasingly active role in the Balkans. In order to prevent another massacre such as the one that had taken place in Bosnia, NATO intervened in the Kosovo War with a bombing campaign. As NATO's spokesman for much of the 1990s, Jamie Shea was one of the organization's most recognizable officials. Probably for me, frankly, uh, the, the, the highlight was uh, in June 1999 um, when the Kosovo uh, conflict came to an end. Uh, the Serb forces withdrew from Kosovo, the NATO forces went in, uh, and I went immediately after the end of the conflict uh, to Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, uh, uh, and I didn't think anybody w would know who I was because I was the NATO spokesman, I'd been on the TV, but why should the Kosovars know me? And thousands and thousands of them suddenly appeared on the street as I was walking along in Pristina and literally mobbed me, uh, put me on their shoulders and carried me and you know, sang my name. And uh, I didn't, I had no idea this was gonna happen because I'd been the face of NATO and it was just seeing the complete joy on the faces of these people that the Serbs had pulled their forces out uh, and that they now had the chance you know, to live in freedom and to create their own uh, state eventually, Kosovo. I mean, I'm not saying again that it's all been a perfectly successful story. Life is life, but it was a wonderful moment of seeing that you know everything NATO had done in difficult circumstances to conduct this air campaign, which was not you know without its difficulty, uh, you know, and its tragic incidents even. But nonetheless, it had been successful at liberating these people uh, who could now you know come out on the streets and not worry about being shot or persecuted any longer, um, and uh, they could you know look to the future, so that, that was a great moment. Yet, despite the jubilation and relief felt across NATO, that precise moment in 1999 actually marks a turning point in the West's relations with Russia, which started to be very apprehensive about the United States' support of humanitarian interventions. By the time we got to, to uh, the Kosovo um, conflict at the end of the 90s, there was less trust on the Russian side and more concern that uh, with the, the language of responsibility to protect, the West was um, trying to, uh, to create rights to intervene in other countries that really didn't belong to it. And I think at that stage, you know, even quite cooperative Russian diplomats wanted to see more being handled in the UN um, and less um, unilateral action by the, by the West. NATO's involvement in the Kosovo War remains controversial to this day. Could NATO have done something differently? You don't get do-overs in history. If the West had not intervened, and if Milosevic had been able effectively to, to carry out ethnic cleansing in Kosovo and to drive a lot of Kosovars into what I guess now I must call North Macedonia, but you know, into the neighboring countries, probably destabilizing them quite considerably. You know, what would the consequences of that have been? Would they have been better or worse? It's very hard to say. You know, at the time there seemed to be a humanitarian imperative to act, and the West acted. I think you know you could you could argue that we ought to have made more efforts at that time to to try to find common ground with the Russians to be able to take action through the United Nations. NATO's expansion in Central and Eastern Europe and its involvement in Kosovo coincided with a profound political shift in Russia, as Boris Yeltsin was succeeded by Vladimir Putin. It was very important for the countries that had been incorporated either into the Soviet Union or as part of the Eastern Bloc to resume what they considered their rightful place in Europe with their transatlantic outlook. So we saw NATO enlargement um, starting in 1999. And I think we very much focused on we, the West, on our own agenda. And in doing that, 
we took our eye off the ball. We didn't think about what was happening in Russia. I think Putin, that's the simple answer, Vladimir Putin, um, essentially when he became president, well, first prime minister in 1999, then president in 2000, uh, there was a kind of brief moment where Western leaders like Tony Blair, George Bush, remember him, uh, thought that, that Putin was a Democrat, a leader from a younger generation, and not Yeltsin, if you like. But pretty quickly, it was clear that he was intent on, on restoring a kind of Soviet or neo-Soviet style of government at home with, with authoritarianism, with civil society being squashed, um, with the sudden murders of, of critics and dissidents, and uh, an aggressive and revisionist policy internationally. NATO's enlargement was interpreted by the new Russian president as an aggressive move that humiliated the West's former enemy and destabilized the region. NATO has expanded. It probably won't expand much further east, but it has, from a Russian perspective, subsumed territory that the Russians had a understanding, even if it was not true in international law or in history or in fact, but in their mind, they, NATO has taken Soviet, now Russian territory, and it is seen to be aggressive. When NATO was expanding, the, the discussions in London and Washington and Brussels weren't, this is an aggressive move. This was to secure the countries that wanted to be part of the club. NATO is not, it's not an aggressive club. It's not a compulsory club. You have to want to be in the club. Russia's support for the United States after the attacks of 9-11 and the establishment of the NATO-Russia Council in 2002 created the hope that the two former adversaries could continue to cooperate into the 21st century. However, the controversial decision of the United States and Great Britain to go to war with Iraq without a UN Security Council resolution marks a turning point in the relations between Russia and the West. I think things continue to deteriorate, particularly when you had the, uh, the intervention in Iraq. And, I mean, these days, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the, the weapons of mass destruction that weren't there and so on. I think the interesting thing was that at the time, the Russians didn't question the American evidence and Western evidence, British evidence, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it, it subsequently became clear that he did not. Um, but at the time, I think the Russians also thought that the way that Saddam was behaving indicated that he had something to hide. Now, they, didn't, they did not agree with the Western intervention. I want to make clear, I'm not suggesting that you know, they implicitly endorsed what the West did in invading Iraq. But it, certainly in the discussions that went on in the, the UN, they didn't challenge the basic premise that Saddam was doing something that he should not be doing. The argument was about how the international community should respond to that. And I think once you got beyond 2003, then really you had much more of a, a rupture. The, the Putin story is that Iraq sad relations and that he was part of a coalition with, with Gerhard Schroeder um, and um, with others uh, against American hegemony and imperialism and so on. Um, I mean, there is something in that. I mean, it would be wrong to say that, that, that the current state and relations between Russia and the West is all Russia's fault, that the West made missteps, uh, for sure. But I also think that, that, that Putin is, is, is a zero-sum thinker. He, he sees the world in pretty binary terms. What is bad for NATO is, is good for Russia. What, what, what is excellent for Moscow is, is pretty awful for, for London and Washington and Paris and so on. Um, so he's not really interested in, in mutual solutions. He is interested in prevailing. And you, you have to say, looking at the events of the last few years, that he's doing pretty well. We need to learn from our mistakes. I think, unfortunately, uh, people in many countries were very quick to say the Cold War was over. And a memorable phrase that was used to me by an official in Germany was, we forgot how to deal with Russia. Relations between Russia and the West would soon take a dark turn, causing temperatures to drop further.